Hi, this is Buckle It Up or Shells Die. My name is Will Schroeder. My handle is HarmJoy on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a technical architect here at SpectreOps along with my coworker Lee here. I've written a lot of code over the years, mostly offensive stuff. So I was one of the founding members of the Veil Framework, the Empire Project, rest in peace, PowerView and PowerUp, also rest in peace, I guess, uh, the Bloodhound Graph Analysis Project, and more recently over the past few years, Ghost Pack, which includes Seatbelt, which will be the highlight of this presentation. I've talked to a lot of conferences, DerbyCon, which is, used to be my favorite until it stopped going last year, Black Hat, DEF CON, Troopers, a whole bunch of others. I'm also a veteran trainer, so I teach the Adversary Tactics Red Team Operations course. I help write our PowerShell course that was retired last year, and I sometimes blog at blog.harmjoy.net. Hi, my name is Lee Christensen. I'm also a technical architect here at SpectreOps. In terms of codes and my interests, I, I wrote Seatbelt, which this talk is about. Um, some other tools that have been incorporated into other tools and frameworks are Spool Sample and Unmanaged PowerShell. In general, I just love Windows and Windows internals, Active Directory, PowerShell, um, and just attacking new enterprise tech that we see as we do engagements. I just like enjoy discovering new ways to attack organizations. Um, I've also spoken at a lot of cons, DerbyCon, Black Hat, et cetera. Um, I've also done a bunch of training. I help out with our Adversary Tactics Red Team Operations class, um, as well as our new course, the Adversary Tactics Vulnerability Research for Operators. I rarely blog at that Medium link right there. This presentation is all about host-based situational awareness. We're gonna go over what it is and why we believe it matters and how you can use it. We're gonna cover data collection with Seatbelt, which is the C-sharp tool, part of the Ghostpack project that I mentioned previously. We're gonna also see how host-based situational awareness ties into different parts of the attack cycle, from initial access, lateral movement, strategic hunting, things like that. Within this, we're going to cover a few different topic areas. First and foremost is going to be defensive enumeration, what defensives are there, where are the configurations. We're also going to cover exploitation and vulnerability research target selection, which we'll, leave. we'll go into more detail here in a bit. Some stuff on credential theft, which is always fun. User and system behavioral baselining. And finally, we're going to wrap everything up with uh, technique selection. So given a particular phase of the attack cycle or something you want to do, how does this situation awareness data affect your decision tree and what you're actually going to do on post? And we'll have a nice little kind of final walkthrough for that as well. Cool. So host-based situational awareness. Why does it matter? What is it? Uh, we're going to dive into this. So host-based situational awareness. What is it? Well, host-based situational awareness is trying to perceive and gain an understanding of everything that's going on or on around you in the environment. And in the case of host-based situational awareness, uh, we're only gonna be using artifacts that we're collecting from the host that we're on. So there's different ways that you can do situational awareness. There's network situational awareness. There's things like OSINT. In this case, we're specifically using data that we're obtaining from the host machine that we've compromised. Uh, why this is so important is because as we collect data during an op, uh, this should be influencing the TTPs, the different techniques that we're using throughout the engagement. Uh, so as we enumerate data, we learn more about the environment, the, what, what's there, what we can interact with, and this should be guiding us as operators into how we're acting inside of the uh, environment. And for us, doing this host-based situational awareness is one of, I'd say, one of our greatest sources of data that influences our, the techniques that we use and select on our operations during, and during assessments. What kind of things does situational awareness let us know about? Well, for one, it lets us know about capabilities. So what can we even do in the environment that we're in? Like, what is possible? So this is just giving us an understanding of like, this is what's in the environment and it's at our hands and we could even, we could use it if we wanted to. And then it also informs us strategically. So now that we know what's possible, because we know what's in the environment, this is going to help inform us the next step that we want to date or to take and also how we're going to perform that step. Part of this is doing target selection. So maybe what's the next machine that we want to target? 
And then once we target that machine, how are we going to actually gain access to it? What lateral movement technique do we want to use? How do we want to, or do we just want to compromise that machine instead? So host-based situational awareness is going to influence what strategy we're going to take as we move throughout an organization as well. We're big proponents of using data to guide our ops. One of my favorite sayings is just any action you any action that we perform is in an environment is a detectable risk. So that means, you know, we're a foreign entity in this environment. We are abnormal. And so therefore, there is a risk that we're going to be detected. And one of my favorite sayings is everything is stealthy until someone is looking for it. So if we can kind of gain an understanding of what people are looking for uh, and aren't looking for, we can, this will help us remain evasive. And part of this, too, is understanding what they can even see. So if they can't see us, if they don't have telemetry or if they don't have certain audit settings enabled, we can remain outside of the defender's visibility and remain stealthy. A big part of this too is understanding your risk tolerance for detection. What this comes down to really is, you know, how, uh, what is our tolerance in terms of getting detected by the defenders? And this is ultimately going to be determined by a few factors. Uh, one of them is the assessment training objective. So maybe part of our training objectives during a red team is to get caught. Or we, maybe we want to emulate a specific threat actor and uh, we don't really care about trying to evade. We want to select those specific TTPs that that actor is using. Another thing that will influence our risk tolerance for detection is our attack strategy. Probably the most common attack strategy is low and slow. So you're trying to remain evasive, trying, uh, you know, not going interactive or making a lot of noise on the network. Well, that is completely valid, but smash and grab is just as equally valid. You could compromise a machine and immediately start uh, siphoning off data, or you could be like ransomware and just start encrypting everything inside of the environment and trying to spread as fast as you can. And that's just as equally as effective attack strategy, depending on ultimately on what your goal is when you compromise a machine. Why we like to point this out is because in light of what we like to term enlightened actors, this kind of fictitious being out there, they, they understand the impact of their actions that they're performing. And when they perform these actions, they're making a decision, a risk-based decision before they make it perform an action. And this is largely to prevent detection. Why use a certain technique at all if it's going to get you detected? A good example is like Mimi Cats. Why use Mimi Cats? if there's a risk of just running the tool that's going to get you detected. So understanding like these unlightened actors are, before they use a technique, they're going to calculate a risk associated with it. In order to calculate this risk, you need to first collect some data so that you can make decisions based off of that data. Then you're going to calculate that risk and then finally act accordingly. So it's a, a good example of this, like I mentioned, Mimi Cats is a, is a very prime example. Uh, one of the first things that we often see, so in our red team training class, is people, when they compromise a host and, and escalate to system privileges, one of the first things that they'll do is try and run secure LSA logon passwords, the most infamous command of Mimi Cats. And this is to try and obtain the credentials on the machine. So why... Like, why do people do that? Oftentimes it's just instinct. And so something that we try and emphasize is don't perform actions without thinking. Something to keep in mind is, you know, is it even worth it to perform that credential extraction? First of all, are we elevated on a machine? Uh, are we even gonna be able to read like LSAS's memory? Are there other users on the machine? If we run that, we're not going to obtain other credentials. So if there's nobody else logged in, why even run this? Um, alternatively, like is W Digest, if we're targeting plain text passwords, if W Digest isn't enabled, then we won't be able to obtain the plain text passwords. Similarly, what other defenses are going to affect the, our extraction of credentials? There may be EDR products on the machine that are going to prevent us from using Mimikatz command here. Similarly, maybe there's a blind spot or there's a way that we can evade a certain defense due to how the host is configured. A good example of this is like maybe run as PPL is enabled or cred guard on the machine is enabled. Uh, these will prevent a user mode attacker from being able to dump LSAS's memory and obtain password. So like why even run Mimikatz if those are enabled? Uh, similarly, this is going to influence how we run 
any code that we, that we want to load onto this machine. So for example, there's a lot of tooling now written in C Sharp or even C. When we do our host situational awareness, that's going to influence uh, maybe some of the evasive measures that we need to put in place before we run those tools. So for example, with like PowerShell or C Sharp, maybe there's uh, AMZ inspection uh, due to the certain version of PowerShell or C Sharp. Something else that uh, host situational awareness influences is it's somewhat dependent on the attack phase that we're in. So for example, in our experience during initial access, this is one of our most fragile parts of an engagement. We first gain access to a network and we don't know how the computer is configured. We don't know if they've been tipped off that we've compromised a machine. And so our, our strategy tends to be is trying to collect as much data as we can from the host especially about the defensive tooling and the defensive configuration of the machine, so that even if we do get kicked out, uh, a better roadmap of how we can re-compromise the network. Similarly, when you're doing things like lateral movement, a different phase of attack, this same kind of data can be rem remotely enumerated. So maybe before we, I'd say we oftentimes in environments, we notice that hosts are configured differently. So uh, the most simple example is uh, workstations are often often have different logging and tooling installed than server machines. And so before maybe before we pivot to a server machine or any machine in the network, we would want to re remotely enumerate the tooling and the processes and the defensive configuration of that remote machine before we load an agent there. Or maybe based off of that data, we don't want to go there anymore because they have certain settings enabled or maybe certain EDR products. Another phase that we kind of get into during our assessments is well, like what we like to call strategic hunting. It's a type of collection. And this is looking for specific data or objectives that will help us further our access in the network. So a good example of this is maybe looking for cookies for cloud platform, maybe single sign-on cookies that we could steal. And then we'd be able to log into websites as whatever IT administrator those cookies belong to. Cool. Now a little bit of weaponization with Seatbelt. So the original goal for Seatbelt, it really just started as a handful of these safety checks that were built into a PowerShell script that Lee and also uh, one of our coworkers, Andrew Childs, worked on in the past. We kind of smashed all this stuff together. It was just a bits and pieces that we would collect whenever we land on a host. So a few years ago, we started rewriting this to be c -sharp compatible. Since then, it has heavily expanded. We're at a, over 100 different commands, and we really kind of want it to be a clearinghouse for any host-based artifacts that might be interesting from a security perspective, so offensive or defensive. One thing to note is that it might seem like there's a lot of weird, maybe sometimes esoteric modules, but all of these have been something we've used. Every single bit of data collected here has value to us, at least in some engagement. So we didn't just make these up to be cool. So the current goals of Seatbelt, we want to identify data sources that are useful for an attacker, so like you know, identify these little pieces that maybe people weren't necessarily aware of or that you could even collect. We also want to point out what's possible to collect and provide source code examples in a centralized place. A lot of these things were scraped from different bits of Stack Overflow and other projects and figuring things out from weird old forums. We want to have everything centralized in one place, like how do I get the DNS cache? How do I get these particular event logs or whatever? We've also started doing data interpretation callouts. So there's a lot of data here. We know that. And we've started trying to build in processes that will notify an operator of interesting artifacts, like is WDigest enabled, is PPL enabled, or you know, is UAC set in a particular setting in a way that prevents or allows lateral movement with local administrative accounts? Because again, this data is great, but it doesn't mean anything if we don't know how to interpret or understand it. But admittedly, we have a huge amount of room for improvement here, and we're gonna go into kind of maybe what we hope to do in the future at the end if we have time. This is mostly just kind of for a reference because we're gonna publish this slide deck after the talk, but Seatbelt has a lot of different collection primitives because beyond, what you're trying to collect and what it means, you also care about how you're collecting it. So a lot of stuff, file reads and you know, .NET event log stuff and all that isn't too crazy. The one thing that's kind of interesting is for remote registry reads, we use the standard regprov provider 
over WMI. So we can actually read remote registry entries without having the remote registry service enabled, which often isn't on desktops. And we're gonna go over the local versus remote collection here in a sec. So modularity. So Seatbelt was also built with modularity in, in mind. So making sure that we can basically on the fly add new modules and do so without having to refactor or add a bunch of new code. Similarly, because it is pretty modular, you can also remove functionality quite easily as well. And why would you wanna do this? Well, to reduce your footprint on the host, basically making it uh, less easy to detect you. You can remove modules or, or components of Seatbelt to remain evasive. Every command follows a basic template. Uh, you can find in the repo at that template.cs. Uh, just an example of what that looks like. You give a command name there. You can provide a description. Seatbelt also has groups of commands, so we'll dive into that in just a little bit too. You specify whether or not it supports remote capabilities, so can I run this against a remote machine? And then you fill out the actual implementation of the command. So they're actually quite easy to implement. We, I've, several times on assessments, I've created new modules on the fly to build out new capabilities. Like I mentioned, commands can be put into groups, into one or more groups. So you can execute that with the dash group parameter, and then you just specify the group name. So for example, group equals all is going to execute everything. But maybe if you just wanted to do some enumeration around like the Chromium based products, so is Chrome installed on the machine or Brave, or then you can run the Chromium group and it's going to enumerate a bunch of information about Chrome based applications. Uh, similarly, if you want to run all of the commands that can be ran remotely against a machine, then you do the remote group. So there's a, a bunch of different groups. They're all very useful. In addition to, uh, like I mentioned, you can run commands remotely. If you want to run an individual command or a group of commands remotely, you specify the dash computer name parameter, and that's just going to give you your target computer. Uh, when you run seatbelt without any arguments, it's gonna display its help. And in that help, you can see what commands support remote collection by the, by the plus sign next to them. So the first entry there, you see AMZ providers, it has a plus off to the left of it. And that's just indicating that you can do, you can perform remote enumeration with this command. Seatbelt commands also can have arguments. It, most of them are in the source code and uh, not, not fully documented. There are also a, there's a global argument called dash full. Um, by default, we try and filter down the output of modules to be the most useful and not print out uh, superfluous or, or unnecessary data. And so it's the output is filtered by default. So if you want all of the output, the raw output, use the dash full art global argument. Uh, example of this is with the logon events command. It takes an argument that is saying, if you do logon events 60, that will return the logon events for the past 60 days instead of its default of 10. Similarly, with, if you want to search the Windows search indexer, you can specify a path as an argument. Likewise, you can output data to, in different formats, and this is also modular, so you can swap this out with your own custom serializer if you'd like. The default is just text, so if you wanted to output to a text file, you could specify the text file. Uh, similarly, you can do like JSON output, which is nice if you're trying to digest this by backend systems. It's, it's structured, which makes it really nice. And that's just an example of like what the JSON data looks like in the output. All right, so that's kind of the overview of situation awareness, the weaponization with seatbelt. Now we're going to go into a few different specific areas and give some examples of what seatbelt collects and why we think it's useful. The first part, the safety checks, defensive enumeration. What we really care about is what defensive tooling is there and how is it configured or misconfigured. What detective and preventative operating system settings are enabled, specifically like audit logs, host-based firewall type stuff, you know, obviously things like AMZ and whatever else, or credential guard, PPL, these types of things that are meant to make our lives harder as attackers. So these settings and these defensive toolings and these things that are there are going to affect both tools and technique selection. So maybe it affects how we dump credentials from the host, because maybe a particular EDR we know always flags our method for dumping LSAS, but maybe another one doesn't. But maybe we can extract tickets if we can't actually touch LSAS. 
Maybe Empire is good to go, or you can use Beacon or you need a custom agent because of the custom configurations in this particular EDR solution. We also care about things like how does, you know, IT legitimately administer machines, which that might affect the tools and techniques that we're choosing. Because maybe PS exec is off the table, except maybe they use PS exec all the time, you know, and you see system terminals installed everywhere. So maybe that brings that particular technique and tool back into the fold. This enumeration can let us know like what is possible and also what might get you caught. Obviously, this is a little easier said than done depending on the EDR, but we'll go into a few examples here in a second. And in most of these sections, I'm also gonna give a reference or we're gonna give a reference for the relevant modules that we believe apply to this particular subject area. We're not gonna go over all of these. This is just a reference if you view the deck after. So here's a first example, ones we use all the time, .NET and PowerShell. We've talked a lot in our trainings and publicly in different talks and things like that about .NET version 3.5 versus like, you know, 4.0, those types of things for .NET stuff. Specifically, AMZ can be enrolled for .NET 4.8, but if the 2.0 of the CLR and 3.5 of .NET itself is still present, you can actually invoke that version of the .NET framework and you won't be subject to any of these security protections. And the same thing with PowerShell, the infamous version two downgrade type thing. So these at the top, we will see the data that's collected. At the bottom, we see some of those operator callouts that we were talking about, where it actually checks the settings and will display messages based on the combinations of these different things that result. Like, can you do a downgrade? Bypass AMD. There's also obviously things with the defensive EDR solutions themselves. So we have an interesting processes type module that rolls up defensive stuff, administrative tools, things like that, and calls them out. You know, obviously here, we have Windows Defender, so what if we run the Windows Defender module itself, which is more specific, and that'll give us like path exclusions, process exclusions, to where you know, locally or before we laterally move, maybe we can just use these particular folders to shuttle all our malicious code around and not have to worry about dropping our kind of Gucci evasive type stuff. And here's another one that we use very frequently, LSA settings. One of the things that it'll display is if PPL is enabled or not. So LSAS protected process light or protected mode. So this is a way, it's a window setting that actually prevents any project or any process from getting a handle to LSAS easily. So this is something definitely to be aware of. Also LSA settings will also pop up if W Digest is enabled or not with an operator callout as well. The next thing that Seatbelt helps us with is exploitation and vulnerability research and target selection. So like identifying attack surface and ex trying to exploit it. When it comes to exploitation and vulnerability research, basically what this is, this is helping us identify anything that's on a system that we may want to attack. Uh, common scenarios for this are privilege escalation and then lateral movement and domain escalation. So for privilege escalation, maybe we're looking for the applications that are have insecure configurations. So, you know, like misconfigured services or misconfigured file permissions. You know, PowerUp is a good example of what some of those misconfigurations are. Uh, helps us also identify maybe custom binaries that are on the machine that, uh, in our experience, custom binaries do, are, aren't as secure as like, say, Microsoft built binaries. Um, so, the, the people developing them do not uh, aren't as security conscious, so uh, we may want to analyze those and identify vulnerabilities in them. The same goes for lateral movement and domain escalation. Uh, we may identify misconfigurations on a host that would allow us to move laterally to another machine, or maybe we, we identify a, a custom, or a third-party piece of software that looks interesting. It has a large attack surface and then we do a little bit of quick vulnerability research and we identify a vulnerability that we can ex exploit uh, in this software and we can use that to move to other systems. In general, I'd say the big questions here are we're, what we're looking for as the attacker is what things are running maybe uh, in a, as a high privileged user, so running as like system, um, and then how fast can we analyze these things? So we, we, we're limited on our time during assessments, so we need to be able to triage them quickly. And then, you know, anything that we identify, uh, is it remotely accessible or can we, is, is it accessible from a high privileged, from a low privileged context? So those are some of the things that we're looking for. 
these are some of the modules that may help us, again, just for reference. And we'll just highlight a few of these in this section. But all of these I've used to analyze the attack surface of a host. So probably the easiest one to understand is like services, the processes, and the scheduled tasks on the machine. So from an attacker perspective, what we're interested, you know, what processes and services are running as system, uh, what's even there in the first place. Also, something that we look for is, is a program.net. Uh, why this is interesting to us is just because I'm not a great reverse engineer, but if it's a .NET application, I can quickly analyze it. I can basically throw it into DNSpy and get the source code really easily. As a result of doing this and looking for these things, we identify targets that we can quickly look at and find vulnerabilities in. And we do, we've done this repeatedly on assessments of identifying third-party software or custom software that the company has built, and then we attack them. It is a very common thing that we abuse in environments. And I'd say it's probably one of the most common ways that we escalate privileges, especially on hardened hosts, and we escalate privileges in a domain now. So identifying these vulnerabilities in software that are deployed everywhere in environments. This is showing the processes command and the services command. Part of the output of this is the is.net field, letting us know if something is .net and we can quickly triage it. Similarly, it's giving us insights into what user services are running as. So in this case, it's running a system. So that might be a target for privilege escalation. Similarly, it'll give us version information as well as, you know, is it .NET? An assessment, actually, as I was doing this, I identified this exact service, the Intel audio service, saw it was running a system. I thought, huh, and it's .NET. So I was like, huh, I'll quickly look at that. And I identified a vulnerability in it that allowed us to escalate our privileges. And that's that CVE right there. Uh, another one that's very useful for attack surface analysis is the TCP and UDP connections on a host. This is going to let us know, you know, what, what processes open a port and, you know, how accessible is that port? Is it bound locally only or is it bound on all interfaces? If it's bound on all interfaces, if we find a vulnerability, we could use this for lateral movement through remote code execution vulnerabilities. If it's only bound locally, then maybe we can use it for local privilege escalation. Just a simple example of this, uh, showing the TCP connections running on a host. And something here that I didn't know that you could actually do before I implemented this was is you can pull the service name out, which I thought was pretty cool. And you can see that these are all bound on all interfaces. So maybe they're right targets for exploitation. So that IGC service, for example, is a .NET application. And you know, maybe I'd want to go and attack or take a look at it at least to see if, if there's any vulnerabilities. Another uh, very useful one for us is the OS info, which is just basic information about the OS. Here, very simple one, the version of the OS. You know, this lets us know if their if patches have not been installed yet. Similarly, giving us an idea of our current privileges. Uh, is it high integrity or are we local admin on the machine? Um, here you can see we aren't local admin, but there's a call out letting us know, even though we aren't admin, we can bypass UAC um, in order to get admin privileges. All right, so credential theft, the really fun stuff. This is what you're all here for, right? So getting, getting all that awesome juicy creds. This is obviously an essential part of the attack cycle, but it's very, very often oversimplified. Like Lee had mentioned, we often have a lot of people, students or newer operators who are just used to running Sucrosa logon passwords as their first reactive action. But credentials are more than just secure LSA, and there's a lot more ways to retrieve these credentials outside of just running it through this particular Mimikatz command. As far as credential theft goes for seatbelt, uh, all these collection of modules that we kind of include under the credential theft banner will either somehow directly allow for the recovery of credentials or somehow affect the recovery of credential material. We'll go into some examples. Again, here's a reference with all the different things that apply. And we're gonna start diving into a few examples. So one of them we use a lot is logon events. So these correlate data from security event ID 4624 from the event log. So these will indicate what accounts perform inbound authentication attempts successful, uh, 4625s are unsuccessful. Like when do these inbound attempts happen? When do they happen? And exactly how do they happen? 
So some examples of things will happen on a regular basis would be like Nessus or vulnerability scanners, random IT scanning accounts, SCCM pushes, things like that, or just normal manual administrative actions. We also care about what protocols these accounts use when logging in, specifically NTLM versus Kerberos, because if it's NTLM, we could sniff the net NTLM uh, v2 or potentially v1 if we can do a downgrade. We can sniff the hashes or we, could, we can potentially do a relay. We also care about where this account logs in from. This might give us information about like the network or these you know, like authentication patterns, or is it a jump box? Is it you know, a workstation where a sensitive administrator does a lot of their actions from? This will give us an idea of where to go next, all based on this host-based data. One thing to, to note though, is that in order to retrieve all these events, you do need administrative rights. These do read the security event log, but once you get to that point, there's a huge amount of cool information you can do with event log mining. So this is just an example of the output. As you can see up here at the top, we're running the logon events command. Dash Q is just quiet mode, so just press the banner. And then we're saying, give us the events event logs for the last one day. And here you can see some of the interesting things that we learned from this host-based data is, well, for one, the logon type. Here we can see it's a logon type of new credential, which is that's similar to like when you run run as slash net only. Those credentials are only going to be used when authenticating outbound. Why this is interesting is because somebody performed this new credential logon, so they've specified a brand new set of credentials. What that indicates to me as the attacker is I can steal those outbound credentials, so or these domain admin credentials in this case. So that's one useful piece of information from event logs. Another one is the authentication packages that are used during authentication. So here you can see that we're using NTLM. And there's this nice little call out here saying, you know, because it is NTLM, uh, we see that this IT services account is, has been called out specifically because it's using net NTLM v2. So we could sniff that account to steal its password. So that's obviously one form of credential theft that we could do. In addition, uh, using, because it's NTLM, we could potentially do an NTLM relay. There's a, a separate command called NTLM settings in Seatbelt that will let us know some other information like about signing or SMB signing and LDAP signing in the environment. This is also very useful because it helps us when it comes to targeting or, or building out our attack path that we want to take. In the event log, it gives us an IP address of where that authentication, where that account authenticated from. So in this case, that 230.1 address. We know that the IT services account is logged on on that machine with a plain text password. So if we want to compromise that account, we know we can try and maybe pivot to there and steal the account. Another thing that it lets us know, it's, if, if it's using something like Kerberos, you know, it still gives us some ideas of, of techniques that we could potentially use. We see this privileged account trying to log in, so how could we potentially obtain it? Well, maybe we could do a Kerberos to NTLM downgrade, or Maybe we could, uh, that, that host, that dot 200 host is a target now. So we know the IT admin's plain text creds are there. So we could potentially pivot to that machine and steal those creds. Another type of event that we really like to target are security event 4648, which is an explicit logon occurred on the machine. Why this is interesting is because if a program uses a plain text credential to log on as another user, this event log will be generated. And what that indicates to me as the attacker is after looking at, the, at this event log, I now know that there is a plain text credential that has been used on this machine and I can steal it. And it's always gonna be recoverable. So like, I know there's a plain text password here. I just need to figure out how the application stores it or obtains it, and then I can steal it. Some useful bits of information that this lets us know is like the timestamp of when this occurred. We often see that maybe that it recurs on a regular interval, indicating that maybe there's a background job that's part of the application, or maybe there's a scheduled task or a service that starts, stops and starts that is performing this uh, task for us. This is an example of what the output looks like. And so uh, we're looking for the explicit event logs in the last one day. Here we can see that there's three accounts that performed explicit, log uh, explicit logons. So these three accounts, plain text credentials have occurred on this machine. 
Uh, it also lets us know the processes. So in this case, there's PowerShell, ISC uh, used this. So maybe they, uh, there's a PowerShell script that had an embedded credential. And then also the target address of where that account was used to authenticate to. So giving us some context around how this cred was used or what it might typically be used for and where it may have access to. So here we can see that IT services account probably has some sort of access to that dot 200 host highlighted in yellow. Right, scraping sensitive event logs. This is definitely a fun one. There's three different modules that will do this. PowerShell events, sysmod events, and process creation events. So all of these modules will essentially collect data from local event logs that collect information. These specific event logs will contain and collect information about processes that are started or PowerShell script blocks that are run. So with this, sometimes you can get leakage of sensitive credentials or pass in the command line. The most common example would be PS exec with the plain text cred, right? So that's you know, sensitive credential exposure if there's command line logging on that host. So sysmon events and process creation events require admin rights. The PowerShell events does not, which is pretty cool. So we actually run all the data through these through a common set of regexes. This is an example that will pop out of converting a plain text password to a secure string. We have definitely found a lot of these different things through different event logs and hosts. Log on sessions. This will let us know who's logged on to the machine, when they logged on, and what type, uh, their, uh, what, what their log on session type is. And why this matters is that network log on session types, for these types, credentials will usually not be in memory. But non-network log on sessions, like interactive, remote interactive, and network plain text, Credentials will very often, though not always, be in memory. So again, this will let us know, like say we're checking this remotely against another host, is it worth even trying to move to that host and dumping credentials from LSAS? Like are those creds even there before we go through all that effort? Because again, a lot of these modules can be run on remote systems. So this definitely helps in that credential shuffle, credential focused lateral movement to see if it's worth it or not. So this is just an example of the output of that command. And here you can see, multiple logon sessions. So we know that uh, two accounts have logged on to this machine in some way. And it also highlights the authentication package and the logon type that was used. So here we can see that IT admin user at the top logged on with Kerberos and it was a network authentication. And so that user's credentials probably aren't on the machine. Maybe that IT admin logged onto the machine using WMI to execute a command. And when that occurs, because it's a network logon, those credentials aren't there. So we can't actually steal those creds. Um, so we, maybe we, it's not worth us to run Mimikatz on this machine to steal that IT admin's creds. Uh, whereas if you look at the local admin creds there down at the bottom, you can see that the authentication package was with NTLM and it was a remote interactive. So maybe they were using RDP to access this machine. So because it's remote interactive, we know we can um, steal this, we can very likely there are very likely credentials on the host that we can steal. Another module is the SEC package creds module. Um, and what this does is it obtains credentials from security packages on the machine. Um, currently, it's limited to just the NTLM security package. Uh, this is similar to what internal monologue has done. Um, there's a couple other tools that do a similar thing as well. This is just an example of us running it. So, the current user in this case is HarmJoy. And you can see that when we run this, we get the current user's net NTLM v2 hash. And if this was, if net uh, NTLM v1 was enabled on the machine, we could also steal the v1 hash. So you can do this as a low privileged user too. So this can be beneficial in obtaining uh, users' plaintext passwords. You obtain the hash and then crack it, and then you have the plaintext. Cool, last main section, we're gonna hit some user and system behavioral baselining. Again, our standard relevant modules. But for behavioral baselining, we wanna get a sense of what users actually use the system for. Very obvious one is web browsers. What browsers are installed? What are the versions? Where do they navigate to with these browsers? Like book, bookmarks, tabs, history, there's modules to recover all these for different browsers. Are there credentials stored, passwords or cookies? Um, are there any remote administration tools that are used regularly, like SSH, FTP, RDP? 
Then also some like standard usability things like Office or Explorer, most recently used locations, recent documents, uh, recycled in, things like that. We also care a lot about Chromium. So Chromium-based browsers include Chrome, Edge, Brave, and Opera. These are the main ones. All these collections work locally and remotely. Here's an example of running the, the Chrome Presence module, which we'll find those history cookies and login data type stuff. It'll also detect if Chrome is using version 80 plus, which is affects deep API and credential recovery. This is, we, we're increasingly looking at uh, using this on assessments because we find so many saved passwords, as well as cookies that we can use to access other and impersonate other users on the network. Also Slack. So if you have access to someone's uh, Slack instance or you're executing their user contacts and access to their Slack files and cookies, you can actually clone someone else's Slack access, which we've done plenty of times. We have a, a post on it from one of our operators actually. This is just an example of picking out some of that data with Slack presence, workspaces, downloads, things like that. Last section, we're gonna touch through a couple of kind of walk throughs and explain our thought process. Host-based situational awareness data influences the techniques that we use. For example, mm -hmm. with persistence, seatbelts last shutdown and powered on events are giving us an idea of how often this machine is rebooting or going offline. And so if it doesn't go offline, then we probably don't even need to drop persistence. We can just stay running in memory for a long time. Similarly, uh, it may let us know what technique we're going to use for persistence. So we could look at the WMI event subscriptions, and rather than creating a new one, let's just replace an existing one. Or we may look and see that there are several scheduled tasks or custom scheduled tasks registered in the environment. Let's just DLL hijack one of the scheduled tasks and uh, get execution through that way. Similarly, it applies to like lateral movement. Um, using the Windows Firewall command, we can see what restrictions are there. Um, you know, 445 might be blocked in the network. So we're gonna, that's going to uh, restrict what lateral movement techniques we can use. Uh, there's a lot of modules that help us understand attack surface that we've attacked, we've already talked about. But they can also be ran remotely against a machine as well. We can also identify things that are running that we can potentially, you know, hijack or uh, hijack execution through. So for example, through DLL hijacking, or we could uh, backdoor one of the executables and gain execution through there. So the same things are gonna apply, schedule tasks, WMI event subscription, services, et cetera. This, another very useful thing is understanding the EDR products. So we've used EDR products for remote code execution on hosts on several occasions. So you, most EDR products have like a remote interaction component um, that allow you to temporarily like execute shell commands on a host. So that's what we've used for lateral movement uh, through, I'd say, several EDR products. In addition, there's a UAC module. And you, the UAC settings affect how local accounts authenticate and whether or not you can actually use them for lateral movement. And so that module gives us some nice, a nice summary of whether or not we're gonna be able to use local accounts for lateral movement. All right, and our last little walkthrough. The next following few slides, we'll talk through escalating on a system and moving laterally to a second system. We're gonna talk through some example individual data source results and how they affect the steps, of the next steps of the attack process. And the big point here is we're hoping to talk through parts of the attack of the thought process for the attack and how these new data sources affect the decisions we're making as we're moving to these next steps. The first example, we land on the host, we run our standard you know, situation awareness stuff we always do. We see that PowerShell is installed, 5.1 is installed, but also version two is still installed. We see, okay, we can do a PowerShell downgrade to avoid AMZ, script block logging, all these security settings that are specified for v5. So this affects the weaponization of what we're trying to run and how we're trying to run it. We also see with logon events that there is a Vuln scanner account that is authenticating to the system using NetNTLM v2. So while we can't, maybe we could do a NetNTLM v1 downgrade, we can at least sniff this NetNTLM v2 challenge response and try to crack the password for it. And how are we gonna do this? So this is what we're trying to go after and how we're gonna do it weaponization style is through 
PowerShell, because we know that V2 is now currently on the host, so we can safely run our offensive code. And we can verify this showing PowerShell version two, VS version table shows two. So because of this, we decide that we can run Inve securely without tripping any defenses. So we run Inve, we see that the Voln scanner um, inbound NetNTLM V2 challenge response comes in. So this is crackable in our example scenario here. Then next steps, we're still on that same host. One of the other examples we saw was this WSUS for the patching server. So we're making this logical assumption like, okay, you know, based on this host-based data, maybe we have some blood down, Bloodhound data or something else. But this Voln scanner account, we're assuming has access to a lot of different systems. So we're gonna try it on that WSUS server because we're assuming that the WSUS server probably has elevated accounts on. And we'll verify that assumption here in a bit. So we see we're running this Voln scanner with that crack credential and we have access to the WSUS server. Now, we can then run a bunch of our situation awareness remotely because we have administrative access to that WSUS server. So we're gonna run this with our remote grouping. We see an example here with logon sessions. We have an administrator with an interactive logon session, so we can steal their credential. And just as another example, we see that there are no firewall restrictions for domains. So good to go. And the last bit is we're also gonna see results for schedule tasks. And we see that the schedule task is running the system. It's gonna kick, kick off a VBS script and it runs every day, once a day. So because of this, we decide in our scenario here that we are just going to backdoor or append onto the existing VBS using like a .NET to JScript style payload based on other settings of the host that we find. And then our lateral movement is just making one file modification, not starting services, not modifying anything else. That's just kind of an example of like a walkthrough for this type of stuff. And for some final wrap up thoughts. Yeah, this seatbelt is here it's a, a to collect host-based data. And anytime we find something interesting that we can collect that through host-based artifacts, we want to, we're trying to add it into seatbelt. And this is useful for the current host we're on as well as any machine that we may be pivoting to because we can run these commands remote. And ultimately, uh, as like that example showed, the more data you collect, the better decisions you can make on, on your engagement. So as you're collecting this data, you're gaining a better understanding of the network. As an offensive person, it's gonna help you make better decisions to remain evasive and also have a better understanding of how the network is configured and what hosts there are. And uh, this will influence the next steps of our attack path. All right, so thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please ask. Thank <music> you.